Well, welcome to uh, History 1302, Part 1A, B, something like that. Uh, from the uh, earlier lecture today on World War I, we're going to wrap up that for the next 20 minutes or so. And after that, I'll probably actually go into the next lecture. So I guess one of the housekeeping uh, matters that you need to attend to, and hopefully I'll look at the camera and not at the screen in front of me, is the fact that uh, on Monday we're not going to have class. So you can celebrate now, uh, dance around the room. But, of course, if you're watching this video, uh, this lecture online uh, through YouTube, uh, the, the catch is, is that you've got to watch the lecture I'm going to miss. Uh, you're going to have to watch the, the lecture I'm going to not give on Monday and just do it online. So uh, I've got to go take care of some personal matters on Monday so we won't have class on Monday. Uh, we will have exam on Friday. So those are some housekeeping matters for you to attend to in, uh, for the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, 10 o'clock class. So when we last uh, were discussing things, uh, we were just getting our toes into the water World War I. And so uh, realistically, when we talk about World War I, we need to uh, get a hold of, and get our minds around a couple of important matters about the war. First of all, it's a very bloody affair. It's at least 10 million people dead. Some will say it's closer to 12 million. Uh, uh, only God knows how many people actually died. Uh, of all the wars that uh, have been fought that I'm personally aware of as a historian, this is probably the war I would least want to be in, especially on the Western Front in certain areas. Uh, it is, uh, and it's going to start in August, uh, it, it starts on June 28th with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, but the real shooting starts in August of 1914 uh, with uh, the German invasion. So really one of the things we got to discuss here for a second, and I, I kind of touched on it in class at the very end as I was rushing to wrap up, uh, and oh by the way, one other thing, if the phone rings, uh, uh, it is what it is. I'm trying to lecture online, record this. I'm not in a, a bubble, and I've also got people calling. So it is what it is. So long story short is, is that uh, there was a, a fellow, his name was Schlieffen. Uh, uh, the Field Marshal Schlieffen of the German Army had put together a masterful uh, war plan on what to do if Germany finds itself in a two-front war. If you look at a map, perhaps maybe that's what you ought to do, put me on pause and pull up a map of Germany at the outbreak of World War I, uh, you'll see that Germany sits between two large nations, the Russians, which have the largest army in, uh, the, in Europe at this point in time, uh, is obviously a direct threat to the Germans, and there is a close relationship between the Russians and the French uh, that goes back to some uh, uh, mutual defense treaties, uh, partnerships, and what have you. The French still are still smarting from the the humiliation, if you like, that they received at, uh, and that's just Milton right there that jumped down right away, uh, the wonder dog Milton. Uh, one of the things is the French are also going to have a very formidable army. We may joke about the French today being a less than formidable army, though the French Foreign Legion is really good. The reality is, is that uh, in the 19th century and in the early 20th century, the French had nothing to hang their head about. Uh, they were an outstanding army at times. But by the end of World War I, the French army will be hollowed out, gutted, and mutinous, uh, which uh, we'll get to uh, in probably the latter part of this lecture today. So anyways, uh, the uh, French are there. They, they have an agreement with the Russians. And if you look at the German strategic position, uh, they feel like they are a piece of metal between the hammer and the anvil. And what do you do if you get into a war? Now, you got to understand, if you're not familiar with this already, most nations are going to, ha especially most nations that have a formidable military. It's true for the Germans at the time, true for the French, the Russians, British, now Americans, uh, as well as what do you do if you get into a shooting war with X country? Well, let's just say, for argument's sake today, if we got into a shooting war with Chad, uh, a African nation, well, we can pull a plan off the book, off the shelf, more to let, more or less, and prepare for combat. And you now you may modify the plan, but it's there. And the same is true for the Germans. They had the Schlieffen plan. How do we win a two-front war? How do we not get caught in this vice? And how do we survive? And uh, the answer is well. We need to use railroads. And so one of the most important things I think that you can understand about the about World War I is this, especially from the logistical standpoint, it is the issue of railroads. Railroads are going to be a, a certainly important factor, perhaps even decisive factor in how and where uh, World War I takes place. The Germans have a very good intra 
you know, uh, infrastructure for roads and bridges and especially railroads and such. And much of what they're going to plan on is going to run on the timetable of a train. We've got to hit these uh, se sections. We've got to hit these times. and We must make it go. Well, uh, that's ultimately going to hurt the Schlieffen plan. Part of the Schlieffen plan overall strategy was who do we fight first? Do we fight the Russians first? Do we fight the French first? Or do we fight them both and see what happens? Answer was is that uh, from the German perspective is, is that first of all it'd be hard to win a two-front war though it's doable. We must, uh, if we're the Germans, we must put our maximum effort, we must put uh, a far greater percentage, 80% roughly, of our soldiers, we must send them toward France and we must break France, we must destroy France before the Russians can get mobilized. And mobilization is really basically bringing, calling the army up, calling the reserves up and sending them into the field with guns, butter and so forth. The Russians are primitive. The Russians are backwards. And so uh, they are not able to bring their giant army to bear. It's kind of like a cyclops getting going. It takes a while. So if you're the Germans and you do have this logistical advantage, you're going to uh, you're going to rush to the Western Front. You're going to rush to knock out France. And then when the French are knocked out, say, in weeks, six, seven, eight weeks, perhaps maybe two months, maybe a little longer, but not much longer than that, you're going to turn right back around and you're going to attack the uh, Russians as they're just now coming to bear on your eastern front. Now you will have obviously left a, uh, a not necessarily a token force, but a skeletal force out east to kind of block the Russians should something get uh, go beyond your planning. So attack the French first, knock the French out, and that really means knock out Paris. Understand this about the French, it's true in World War II and it's true in their history, is, is that if you knock out Paris, you knock France out. It is the central nervous city of the whole country and it's obviously the most identified with the outside world. Even today, the United States, that cannot be said. The United States, uh, perhaps it's New York City, but others would say Washington, others would say, say, Los Angeles. Uh, and I would like to think that if one of those cities went down, we would still continue to fight. And uh, But that's not true for France. It's Paris, and then there's everybody else. So if you knock out Paris and you bring them down, you're in good shape. Well, the Germans also have another strategic problem on their hands as well. Not only have you chosen the French to go after first if you get into a war with both Russia and France, but the Germans have also got to figure out where do you attack France at. If you look again at your map, and I hope you have that pulled up, if you look at a map of 1914 Europe, what you'll see is Germany has a rather extensive common boundary with France. And so you would think perhaps that that's where the French and the Germans would have their combat and would meet. Well, that's that's uh, the that's the logistical thing, and that's the regular thinking. However, why not go through the Low Countries, aka Holland, or sometimes today known as the Netherlands? Why not go through Belgium and go around that common border? Because that is heavily fortified by the French. The Schlieffen Plan said, "Let's do that." Well, the problem with going through the the low countries is that if you pass through the low countries you take the chance and in fact it's a real risk that the British are going to honor their treaties they're going to honor their uh, their long-standing treaties in defense of the low countries in defense of those nations that if they're violated then that brings Britain into the war and what have you German calculation says this basically if we pass through the low countries quickly and we get into France quickly we can win the war in the west before the British can get onto the coast and get across the ocean and defend the, the uh, low countries. And on top of that, we'll have France. And so what if the British are upset? We're in control. Then we spin back around. This is the Germans still. And we're going to go back and attack the Russians. Sounds good. But like everything, it's all this here, it's about timing. And timing with the Germans is going to be thrown off just enough that in August of 18, 1914, uh, there will be some tenacious fighting, some uh, horrible fighting in uh, the uh, northwestern, excuse me, northeastern part of France at, at the Marne, M-A-R-N-E, the Marne River. In fact, actually, the battles of Marne are the deadliest battles in the entire war of and of a war of deadly battles that are well known, such as Verdun or the Somme or what have you, Wipers or Tannenberg or, or on and on.
So my point is, is that uh, this is a maximum gamble by the, the Germans. And oh, by the way, Schlieffen, thinking about this in the 1890s, said we throw our ma the majority of our people going through that low country down to Paris and then turn back around and head off to the Russians before they can really get going. But that, if you uh, if you uh, make that wing, that wing that's going to pass through Brit, excuse me, Belgium and the and Holland, if you're going to weight that wing down with a million troops, perhaps, well, you don't have an infinite su supply of troops. Uh, so what do you about your border, your common border with France? If you're Germany, you're taking a gamble that the French may, in their own right, go on the offensive and attack into Germany, and then you've left the German homeland exposed to uh, a, a French invasion. What do you do? Well, military planners coming along after Schlieffen had passed from the scene, he died, retired, and what have you, had said, you know what, we better modify the Schlieffen plan and balance these wings out. So we'll put more troops on the common border with France uh, than we had originally, say, but we'll split it, say, 60-40. 60% on the attack, 40 on the defense uh, on the common border with France if we're Germans. Well, long story short, was the attack ground in 1914, in August and September of 1914, the attack ground out. It wound down right outside of Paris. Paris came this close to falling, and the Germans missed their greatest chance. So the war starts off, and everybody's excited about it. Uh, they don't know what they're getting into. Uh, People later on become very cynical about it, and with some justification. I mean, it's it's uh, this great war. It's going to take just weeks. I mean, we'll go to the front. We'll come back. It's almost like a play. But yet, uh, so much is going to be wrecked by this war. So many lives will be snuffed out by this war. It has long, not just a political impact, it also has a long cultural impact. Uh, for those of you who are English majors, uh, love literature, love poetry, uh, some of the greater poets, some of the darker poets and writers that come out of the English speaking or even the French tradition as well, come out of the wreckage of World War I. Hemingway would be an example uh, amongst others. Picasso, in a sense, too. Uh, obviously, after World War One's over, you're going to have the uh, the real libertine aspects of the Parisian nightlife, and then on and on from there. So, uh, this thing has le legs and uh, and and wreckage. So, when you talk about World War One, some basic questions also need to pop up. What makes the war so bloody? Uh, partially, it has to do with the industrialization of the war. So we've got railroads moving massive amounts of men. You have now massive armies that are growing and you have people that you're able to pull off the farm and send them to the front or send them into the army even if they're not at the front. The fact of the matter is you have the railroads being able to funnel all this along. It is mechanization at its best. So uh, what causes the death and destruction? Well first of all most people die in World War I not from gun, uh, gun uh, shots or artillery or whatever. They die from disease. It is still the single largest killer in the war uh, and without a doubt it's, uh, it's really nasty. In fact uh, if you're talking about the war and you say well how bad is disease? One of the largest problems that the, uh, the Europeans are going to have, uh, especially the British and the French, is, is that being in the army could be very nasty. One of the things that you'll see uh, this war do is, is that you'll see it'll affect the language. One of the medical issues that the, the soldiers on both sides of the trenches, both sides of no man's land, uh, dealt with was lice rampant and terrible lice. Now hopefully none of you who are watching this video have ever had lice, but you know like triggers it can be awfully nasty, awfully whelping, uh, it can leave some nasty bumps and so forth and so on. So the English language re, uh, relaxes or changes to it and because of massive campaigns to clean up you're going to get words like lousy. It was a lousy day, delousing is where it comes from. Additionally speaking, uh, so one of the other things you may notice and come out of World War I is, is that men who, who are like me, only the high elites, only those who aren't in the front are able to wear beards. And so realistically, when you talk about beards, and if you look at World in the Civil War, the American Civil War, a lot of those officers, even a lot of the men have long beards, or at least full beards, it's kind of like I have. 
But in World War I, you got to clean the men up. you got to try to tamp down on all those things that afflict a soldier. And so amongst other things is the short haircut, the clean shave becomes almost a uh, requirement, but it's certainly a, a fashion statement long after the war. I'm not saying men never had long hair before, or uh, never had short hair before World War I, but it certainly becomes much more common. Uh, when you talk about World War I as far as its impact upon health, not only that, that you're going to have something that maybe one or two of you worked in a cotton field before, maybe you've known somebody who's worked in uh, the gardening district, is, is that if you are standing in water day after day, you have to deal with, uh, you could deal with an issue called trench foot. What trench foot basically is, is that your, your feet start to rot. They, if you've ever sat in a bathtub for three hours, you know what, or in the swimming pool for three hours, you know your feet turn into little prunes, like your hands turn into little prunes. But it only gets worse, and it starts, in a sense, to melt your feet, especially with if you got boots on, and these men do, and you've got wet socks on. Over time, if you never dry your uh, feet off, your feet will start to peel, and they'll start to come apart. The skin, the outer layer, and even the interior layers will start to meld almost, and as you take them off, it rips the skin off of your uh, foot, and it's on the sock, and it's extraordinarily painful. I've actually had students who uh, worked in the fields uh, too much during one summer, cotton fields that is, and they one of them developed trench foot. But it's really painful, and it hurts a whole lot of men. Something else, uh, I don't mean to be crass about this, but it is fair to say uh, one of the ways that this uh, affects the, uh, this war affects uh, humanity and the English languages is that you're going to have a phrase called the red light district. And ultimately, sometimes up to uh, fifteen to 20,000 men a year in the British Army during the war will be uh, knocked out because of STDs. So my point is, is that uh, health-wise, and perhaps the biggest killer of all war, uh, as far as health is concerned, is aside from pneumonias and that sort of stuff, the garden variety, is what's known as the Spanish flu of 1918. That kills millions, excuse me, millions of people worldwide back about 50 million, uh, but it's really a nasty bug. We'll talk more about that in a coming, the coming lectures. But World War I has a, a, a medical legacy, too, in the sense that you're going to start to see better field operations. You've got to handle on what germs are, and so you want to tamp down on the germs, whereas in the Civil War, uh, you just carved and cut. You removed and just wiped your knife off on your arm, and you went to the next guy, you tied it off, and you amputated World War One, you too try to use some aesthetics. Uh, you do have surgery, uh, ether induced, uh, you know, uh, uh, not the prosthetics. That's the leg, uh, but you're going to also have uh, ether will put you to sleep. Ether will be anesthesia, uh, and not that, it's not pretty to wake up from. You get the throwing up, and it's really unpleasant. But uh, they can perform surgeries. In fact, actually, one of the things, I said the word prosthetic, and I'm glad I did, because one of the things that you'll see in this war is, is that men will have really disfiguring uh, wounds, and kind of like the Civil War, and so in some respects, people over time have called the Civil War a dress rehearsal for World War I. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I, I kind of think it generally is. Uh, but one of the things you'll see with artillery and other high explosives is, is it has the tendency uh, to be very uh, brutal upon bone and flesh. And so one of the things you see in addition to prosthetic arms or prosthetic legs, you'll also see faces that are perhaps uh, a man who's not killed completely. And like I've got my hand up right now, you can see part of my face, but yet if I pulled it away, I, this part would be missing an eye. The, eye the, the bones around the socket would be ripped away, the flesh gone. It would be almost an open gaping wound. If you've ever watched uh, Boardwalk Empire, one of the characters is an old World War I veteran. His name is Richard Harrow. And Richard Harrow uh, is uh, one of the more interesting characters in that show, good and bad. Uh, but long story short was is that he got his face half blown off, and so he wears a mask. One of the things I'd suggest you do is uh, perhaps if you get a little time you find this interesting, go online, do a Google search for masks of World War I, and you'll see men who are their faces are kind of made better. Uh, yes, people will still look at you with that face, but at the same time, it is fair to say uh, that uh, at least when you have that mask on, they're not seeing the whole mess that is your face. So World War I has a nasty effect there. But uh, 
Uh, one of the other things about being in World War I, especially out west, where we really as Americans were going to focus uh, as historians, and, and because that's where we fight mostly, almost too exclusively, we fight in the west, in France. Uh, we're not going to get to that. That will not be on the exam. It will come later, come after the exam, uh, the American portion. But the fact of the matter is the Western Front is going to be defined by the trench, by the trench. Uh, please do not think that trenches in and of themselves are deadly things. They can be, but trenches, in fact, by their design, by their nature, are designed to be a, uh, a protective and a defensive fortification that allows you to kind of root in, dig down, and hold a position, perhaps for a long period of time. A trench is not a straight line from, say, the uh, English Channel all the way down to Switzerland. It's not a straight line. In fact, it is a zigzag pattern up, down, up, down, and so on. Why do you do that? Just imagine, though, if you were, say, a, a, a German, you're making an assault upon a French trench, and it is in a straight line. If you can get in there, get a machine gun nest going, and set up a tripod machine gun, you can do so much damage to everybody, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. But if it is that zigzag pattern on how to build a trench. If you follow that pattern basically, you can only fire so far before there's protection and you can rally the troops. It's really well built. That's Those are the, the, the exterior trenches and yet you have all these supply trenches coming forward to help uh, supply these trenches. But for my money, if I had to be in a trench, if I if you take me and you put me into time and you say well which uh, army would you rather be in for cleanliness niceness and so on as a general rule for cleanliness and dryness I would prefer being in the German army in a German trench a German trench was often much much better and the reason why it was if nothing else it was drier it was dry the Germans made a point, for the most part, to pump the water out of the trench. The Germans were, uh, their trench was effectively defensive in nature, and think of it this way, the Germans, in, in a sense they did, they expected to be there a while, so we might as well make it as homey as we can. They will have dugouts within the trenches. It's kind of an elaborate system. It's not just a simple hole in the ground. It's an elaborate system that's going to have windows in these little uh, dugouts. It's going to be officer quarters with doors and, and, and you name it. It's going to be quite elaborate, and it's actually fairly dry. Not saying it's perfect, but it's a much better trench than a French, British, or an American trench. The problem with a French, British, or American trenches is, is that uh, it's wet. Oh, the water. Sometimes it's neck deep. Not neck deep. That's rare. But sometimes it is hip deep, knee deep, and it's always uh, pretty wet. The, the French tr tr uh, trenches seemed to be the worst. Americans were not much better. The reason they weren't much better is that we had this general philosophy that we're going to go on the attack, we're going to drive the, French, the British out, Germans out, let me get the nation right, we're going to drive the Germans out and run them out of the territory, and then uh, everything will be kosher, good, fine. Well, it took them a long time. It took them to 1917 to pull that off. So anyways, uh, if you were stuck in the trench, it was wet, and on top of that, if, if you think about the mass carnage of World War I, um, one of the things you'll see is, is that you'll see uh, that really some Americans made a lot of money on this. And I don't, don't mean to push the issue of uh, war profiteering because that's a real complaint about World War I in the 1930s. In fact, it's kind of the re one of the reasons for the isolationism in the United States in the 30s, a la World War II Hitlerism and what have you. But uh, there were men who made money off of it. That was melting once again. There were people who made money off of World War I. And uh, a lot, several Americans did it. One of the most well-known and well-used aspect of Americana was, or rather is, the uh, barbed wire. And it is extensively used in World War I. Barbed wire is everywhere. And so just imagine if you're in a woolen suit, a woolen coat, you are covered to the nines, and you go over the top, you make that assault, and you go over the top, and uh, amazingly, you're still alive. You make the assault. And so you're moving along. You have got to get through loosely hung barbed wire. 
the problem is is that as you're moving there's the, the fog of war, the gas, the smell, the smoke, the flame, the fighting, your panic perhaps, perhaps you're calm as a cucumber, but you've got to get through that that barbed wire and if you try to climb through it you get hung up in it and then you're just hanging target. So you'll see men who get carved to pieces hung up in the barbed wire and you can't do much for them. So there are these bodies that are sometimes frankly unburied. The smell of the trench scene in World War I was horrible because of the decaying bodies. And we think of Ameri uh, we think of men, and that's rightly so. But there were lots of other uh, animals who were involved in this as well. I think uh, particularly of horses. And if you can only imagine if a human body stinks, how much more perhaps a horse carcass will uh, stink when it goes into rigorous mortis. If there was ever one animal who said, if, if it had a soul, and of course it doesn't, but if there was one animal that said, aha, and just rubbed its hands together, said, oh, thank you, thank you, and was praising, uh, praising the Almighty for a bounteous feast, it would be the rat. The rat was the true winner of World War I, in a sense. They had a beautiful time. I, I think of this, and I think of it like Templeton. You remember Templeton from, I guess it was Charlotte's Web, how fat he got? These rats are giant. They are fat. They are feeding on the dead and the undead alike. And so, uh, in a sense, imagine if you were, you are a soldier in a, uh, the French and the British had it worse than the Germans, so the Germans had it too. But if you're a soldier in one of those tents, and there you're trying to sleep, you got leaned back like so, you're feeling good. You're getting sleep for the first time in days, perhaps. You're maybe getting a good two hours, and all of a sudden you feel this sharp pain on one of your fingers. A rat bit into your hand and is trying to remove your fingers in the nighttime while you're sleeping. That happened. Rats were known to bite through and eat through tin cans. So you think about your beanie weenies. Think about your Vienna sausages, your spam, your uh, uh, ranch style beans or whatever. That can you've got of green beans in your pantry, a rat bit through that. That's impressive. That's scary. In fact, uh, my favorite story is this one. Some British officers who had had enough of these rats that were just infiltrating everything, eating everything in sight, and just seemingly could not be stopped. These British officers got a hold of themselves of a good cat. cat. An old rough looking, but a real mean and lean, tough. They knew a good tomcat when they saw him, but they sent this tom, this tomcat, into their officer quarters in one of these British trenches one night, slammed the door shut on him, said, go get him, boy. Open the door the next morning, there ain't no cat. Cat's gone. The rats ate the cat. So, a formidable foe who uh, ate a whole lot of everything and did mighty well. So you had to you had to deal with the lice, you had to deal with the trench foot, you had to deal with the cooties, you had to deal with everything. And I cooties is actually another word out of this war as well. But it is uh, the rat, I think, perhaps the most, uh, in a sense, disgusting thing. So if you're in a trench, one of the things you never did was you never put your head above the trench line if you could avoid it. Uh, now, you may have to go out and patrol. That's another story. But if you put your head above the trench line, it's a good chance you're going to get your head turned into a canoe. Sharpshooters and uh, snipers everywhere. That was uh, a dangerous, dangerous thing. So keep your head down. You're doing okay. That's fine. So uh, trenches are not designed to kill, though unfortunately they can make you sick if they're not handled properly and can make you diseased and can kill you in that sense. But they're in fact really designed to be a uh, defensive uh, system in nature. All right, so what was it that made the war deadly? So I've got several things. Number one, the single most uh, the single deadliest killer, the thing that killed the most people in World War I is artillery. Artillery. World War I, you had different uh, variations of uh, artillery. You had uh, short mortars, in a sense, which is a, a close quarter sort of uh, artillery. You had mortar. You had big stuff that could lob all the way to London. Big Berthas is called, but more likely howitzers and stuff that would drop in from, uh, you know, several miles away. All these, these artillery uh, shells, all these artillery uh, carriages and guns would be handled by calculations and math. So first of all, you better know your math. Two, you better be able to do your math. And three, uh, hopefully everything goes right. But artillery, uh, uh, if it got you, it, it had several potential effects upon you. First of all, if it, you, you took a direct blast from a, uh, a Jack Johnson or something like that, or a uh, you know, whiz-bang, uh, some American phrases for different, for different types of artillery. If you took a direct hit, uh, good chances you're not going to be around. 
in fact, actually, uh, you probably have nothing more uh, than just a pair of shoes or a, a, a finger or whatever. It's just, you're gone. There's nothing to bury. Other times, uh, what you'll have is, is that uh, the concussive blast uh, and the, uh, the shrapnel is so great is, is that uh, the, there are a few pictures of these out there. And I'm looking forward to uh, this year, maybe it's next year, maybe 1918 even, or 2018. But the British are going to release a treasure trove of pictures from the war, especially artillery pictures. And I guess it's the macabre nature of the historian within me, the macabre nature I've got, that I would like to see those those pictures fuller and more detailed. But there's a few that made it out, but uh, artillery obviously can cut you in twain, sever you like so. But the problem with artillery, too, or it's it's uh, the byproduct of artillery, is, is that at times... Artillery it was so, if it hits you just right, it could be like it ripped you from the top down to your pelvis and ripped you apart, like some giant, two giant arms just pulled you apart, drawn and quartered you. Uh, and so you see, there's one in one of my books in my office. There is a picture of a man uh, who is essentially severed in twain down around the waist, but he'd been also ripped in half, and so you see half his face and half of his body. So really, it's almost like a quarter. It's really disgusting but it's really a graphic detail of what artillery can do. It is the single largest killer. And last but not least is that if you're under artillery barrages for extended periods of time, in World War I they will call it shell shock. In World War II, battle fatigue and eventually things like post-traumatic stress syndrome disorder, PTSD. The fact of the matter is, is that those uh, the, the men who are going to be not able to hold up under the heavy barrages, and some men can't, it's just what it is. Uh, so these men under heavy barrages cannot hold up under, they lose control of their nerves, some of them break down, some of them are just never the same again. Additionally speaking, uh, if you, the, the, even if the shrapnel never got you, one of the things that could happen is, is that it shakes you so violently, it's kind of like being a linebacker in college or in the pros where you smash up against a running back and you continually have your brain plow into the inner of your skull. Essentially, it's a severe concussion, and we know quite a bit now in ESPN and sports because of what concussion can do. So uh, you have a lot of different ways to die or be maimed or killed from artillery. It, it is bad stuff, and it is the single largest killer in the war. Sometimes it was, uh, by the way, actually it could protect you. But one last thing to say. If you're going over the top of a trench on an assault, you're trying to take uh, – a German position. This is true for the Germans as well. They could lob artillery in in front of the assaulting troops, and the way they would have the math done up is, is that, and the way they'd have the projectiles fired most of the time, is is that the explosion would be going forward. So you could walk right behind an artillery barrage. The thinking was, and it was true, if you don't get held up, you can see what they call a creeping, creeping, like e uh, easing along barrage. A creeping barrage. And so this creeping barrage uh, is designed to protect the assaulting troops, and it sometimes worked. But if that troop, those troops or that platoon or the squad or whatever it was, the assault got slowed down because of something, maybe got hung up in the barbed wire, then the, you kind of get uh, separated from the barrage. And actually being, as, being within about 10 feet or so of that barrage might be the safest place on the battlefield. So you, you, at first you think, well, I don't want to be too close to an artillery barrage. The answer is, real frank, really, frankly, you do. So uh, there's no good way to handle this. You just make the best of a bad situation. The second greatest killer in World War II, it was World War II, wrong war, aha, uh, is uh, the machine gun, a.k.a. the devil's paintbrush. It, too, was developed by an American. American. His name is Hiram, H-I-R-A-M, Maxim. M-A-X-I-M, Maxim, the Maxim machine gun. And it was developed in the 1880s, but its descendants will go on from there. And it's really a, it's, it's beautiful on several levels. Is first of all, it is entirely dependable. It is really well shot and well put together, and its descendants, its knockoffs are the same, belt-driven, uh, cooled, uh, water-cooled or oil-cooled uh, setup, and you can really do some business. The uh, prototypical meaning the first Maxim machine gun, hence the name Devil's, uh, and this is how it got the nickname Devil's Paintbrush, it threw, it said at least, I don't believe it to be a real fact, but it said it shot 666 rounds a minute. 
And of course, that's an allusion to the beast in the uh, book of Revelation. Long story short was is that later on it will be up in the 800s and higher and so on. And finally, you get to the MG42 and World War II and the Germans. They had this great heavy art uh, machine gun go. Bzzz. We Americans tried to play it off and say, oh, it's not that bad, but really it was. But the machine gun could sweep the field, and it was really, really effective. So we're a second worst killer. Now, when you talk about the machine gun, and you talk about it, why was it a great weapon? Number two, not only was it, uh, uh, it, it was really uh, well put together, and you, as long as you didn't just ram a, a, a bunch of dirt through it, it would work. The second thing is it's idiot-proof. It is idiot-proof. Never underestimate that. Now, for some of you watching this, you have been in the Army or the Marine Corps, and you know there are idiots in both. And if you get, some of you may join the Marine Corps, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, and you'll find that there are idiots in the, each branch of the service. Men who, when they go out on a jog, uh, decide, you know, they are going to put on their shoes on the wrong feet. And not because they think it would be cool, they're just not that smart. I'm actually quoting a former student of mine who told me about that. The so long story short is that there are a lot of not so bright people in the army, and you've got to give them something that they can use too. You sit the man down, you give him uh, some training, and you sit the man down behind this machine gun, and he has to press a button, and he just has to make sure the breach is clean, and they can load up the next round, and, the next belt, excuse me, and you're away to go. And so it's a beautiful thing in that sense. So uh, the machine gun is really good. A favorite story of a colleague of mine that I use from time to time, use it today, is that this, uh, just imagine if you were a, a soldier, you know, say a bunch of German soldiers in the aftermath of the Marne, and you're falling back. You're the last, you're kind of like the rear echelon trying to hold the French at bay while the rest of the army retreats in order, trying to get back to trenches, trying to get back to some sort of defensive fortification. There are, let's say, three of you, three machine gun nests, German machine gun nests made up of two or three men per, per nest, and you've got your machine gun set up. And then out in the field, a half a mile away in front of you, are these beautifully uh, clothed, beautifully, I mean, when I say beautiful, I mean, it's not just the uh, the sharpness of the dress, but the color of the dress, that you don't have the olive drabs yet, you don't have the, the bland and blasé colors, the camouflage is not in just yet, but they don't use it. Now, they'll start to use the, the olive drab soon enough. But in World War I, at the outset, you still had those colorful European uniforms. And so these thousands of French soldiers are lining up to assault your position. And you've got to stop them. And there's only about a half dozen of you, maybe a little more, not many. And these thousands of French soldiers step off, and you see them, and you're like, okay, well, we're getting ready to meet our maker. Well, let's see what we can do. We've got these machine guns. Let's go to work. Well, that devil's paintbrush can sweep the field, and it does. Uh, another example would be graphically, if you've ever seen the movie War Horse, not a good movie. I think it's, I wanted to throw up after the first uh, 15 minutes, but I watched enough of it to see this scene, and then I finally didn't throw up, uh, but, uh, and I cut it off. Uh, but if you remember where the cavalry is going to make an assault, a, a British cavalry outfit is going to make an assault on a German uh, front, or German uh, squad, the machine guns the Germans have sweep the field, kill the cavalrymen except for a couple of horses, and, you know, it keeps on with the story. It's kind of a sappy story. That's why I don't like it. It's, it's just, it's Spielberg mush. No, thank you. I'll pass on that. But anyways, that's fine. That's, but those are some aspects to it. When you talk about guns, uh, the, the killing of World War I, people then will start to say, well, what about rifles? What about pistols? What about bayonets. Rifles killed their fair share of people, but it's only in the single digit percentage wise, so it's not a major killer. Obviously, if you got a rifle, you need to know how to use it. Pistols, even less, like uh, bayonets killed like 15 people in the war. Now, obviously, it's not 15, but um, realistically, it's not. It's an infant, infinitesimal number. They basically figured it at like 0.01% of, of war uh, deaths were caused by the bayonet. So the bayonet is really more of a letter opener. Uh, if you're using the bayonet, you're in pretty bad shape in World War One, and that's still true to this day. 
Now you're saying, well, what about some other weaponry? So what about uh, gas? How was gas used in World War I? Now, gas was effectively used. There's really three types of gas that's out there and majorly used by the combatants in World War I. Number one is called chlorine gas, like the chlorine you put in the pool. Chlorine gas Chlorine gas is uh, really not that deadly. It's an irritant. If you get a lot of it, then it can become really debilitating. Uh, but as far as I can, I'm concerned, it rarely kills. Where on the other hand, the second, uh, and that's used in the first war, the second killer in the war, and this one's much, much more effective, is called phosgene. P-H-O-S-G-E-N-E. -E. Phosgene. Phosgene is nearly odorless, and uh, really one of the great ironies of the war when it comes to weaponry is, is that the man, let's see if I can get this thing to quit. I guess I can't. One of the great ironies of the war, and perhaps it's not that great, but it is an irony, is that the uh, creator and the builder and the maker, the chemist of phosgene, is going to, uh, well, he's going to do something that probably many of you have done when you were in chemistry class. You know what they tell you when you get to that Bunsen burner in the beaker and you mixed up this and mixed up that and they tell you to waft it, you know, like waft it into your nose. Well, this chemist creating phosgene gas wafted a little bit into his nose. He went out later that evening and had a great time at a cocktail party. He started to feel sick at about 11 o'clock, got to his quarters by midnight and was dead by 1 a.m. The phosgene had killed him. It's that effective of a killer. It's that effective. You only need a few parts per million to take you out, whereas chlorine, you needed to have it sprayed upon you, basically, to kill you. But phosgene was very, very lethal, uh, but it could be washed off, and it could be avoided fairly easy. So it was lethal, but it wasn't the best. The best killer, the best debilitator of all of the gases in World War One, and this is when you have these gas attacks and where people were so nervous, and it helped contribute to the shell shock as well, not just traditional artillery, where people would wake up and say, gas, 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 what do you do? You put on your helmet, you put on your mask, you put on everything, and then 15 minutes they scream all clear and you try to go back to sleep. So that happened quite often, but the best well, gas of them all. The gas that will make you fear as a soldier is called mustard gas, just like the yellow mustard of your weenie dogs. Well, mustard gas was good on several levels. Yes, it could kill you. It could, if you got enough of it and you inhaled enough of it, it would cause you to start to throw your lungs up. In fact, it would burn through your lungs uh, and it would cause you to spit up chunkage out of your lungs. So that's probably a, a mental image you really didn't want, but it was true. But even if it didn't kill you right away in that sense, you'll see men in the same sort of vein who will be gassed in World War I who will die by 1925-23. One mind, man comes to mind, he was a great baseball player. His name is Christy Mathewson. Christy Mathewson's in the Hall of Fame, won over 300 games, maybe 400 games even. Uh, he was drafted in the U.S. Army, uh, may have volunteered, but he was in the U.S. Army in World War I. He fought like many of those boys did, and he ended up, um, well, he ended up dying uh, shortly after the war because he'd been gassed. He was never the same again. So in that sense, it could kill you soon or it could kill you long term. But even if it didn't do that, it had the ability to uh, really burn you. It could burn through uh, your, your clothing, your uniform. If you got enough of it on you, burn down to the bone. Uh, men will have their genitalia burned off. Uh, they, let's say for argument's sake, you put on your helmet. Well, hang on a second. I've got a helmet. Let me go grab it and put it on. Let's just say for argument's sake... Okay, so here you go. And this is how, you know, you use all this good technology and stuff. All right, let's see. This is a Kelly helmet from World War I. I happened to pick this up off of Flea Bay a few years ago. It works really well. It's actually in pretty good shape. And so if you had your helmet, there you go. I'm a doughboy now. So you have your helmet on, and you're ready to go into combat. And let's say you take it off and you just kind of got lackadaisical and there had been a gas tack the day before and you set the helmet down and it got a little water in it, what have you. And then you picked up your helmet and you put it back on again like so. What is that holding down over my face? That's old. Okay, let's just turn that around. You put it on your helmet, helmet on like so. Good old doughboy. Let's see. There you go. 
like so. You put it on and then all of a sudden your head's burning because you've got the mustard gas on it and now it's burning through your uh, down to your skull. You could get burned uh, weeks after the fact by a mustard gas attack. So it could happen uh, on several different levels. And uh, what you'll see after World War One is over, uh, there are men who are going to be Sorry, I got to watching the screen in front of me, not the camera that I actually had to look at. But what you'll see after World War I is over, and even during the war, these men who have been gassed got mustard all over them, perhaps not in their lungs as much, but they've been burned on their body. You'll see these men laying on beds that are look like tents almost because the sheets are suspended above them. Unlike you and me who are healthy, we can allow the sheet to lay upon us and it doesn't hurt. These men are burned so badly uh, that anything that touches their skin causes them to scream in agony. Uh, and there's not much you could do about it. And that's why gas was so nasty and gas was so fearful, though it really doesn't kill as many people as it sometimes is believed to have killed. Uh, but some of the greater images, uh, whether it's uh, photographic or artistic images out of World War I, are of men who've been gassed and like a bunch of elephants uh, holding on to each other, they're trailing through a, a field going back to the rear for treatment. Other weapons in World War I that uh, are important and have been used or will be used uh, is the, uh, well, let's see, the tank. The tank is not decisive in World War I. It could have been decisive had the war lasted to 1919, but by 1918 uh, the Germans are wearing down and the tank is just starting to come into its own. Truth be told, for most of the war the tank was underpowered and it was very slow, prone to breaking down. But, and on top of that, the British and the French and the Germans did not know how to really effectively use the tank. Now, obviously, that will start to change at the end of the war, and that starts to change, especially in, obviously, the Second World War. But the tank is not decisive. Now, the, the next outfit, that, uh, the next uh, part of the service that you might want to think about and write down uh, is uh, this, this new thing called the airplane. The airplane. Man, obviously, Kitty Hawk, uh, it was it 1901, 1902, 3? I always get those dates exactly off, but right at the turn of the 20th century, there at Kitty Hawk, man was able to slip the surly bonds of gravity and can start to fly and they get better at it and so on. In World War I, airplanes are, especially at the beginning, very still embryonic. And quite honestly, if you wanted to have a death wish, if you wanted to commit suicide honorably, the way to go about doing it was to join the Air Corps. It had a romance about it. A guy named Eddie Rickenbacker is a great American. Uh, then you can think of someone else, a German, who would be, say, uh, Hermann Goering uh, of later Nazi and, uh, and World War II uh, infamy. And then last but not least, the German that everybody knows about is a fellow named uh, Manfred von Richthofen, uh, the Red Baron. All those men, plus many others, uh, are going to fly in World War I. Unfortunately, most men who flew in World War I did not survive. Uh, that's why I said if you wanted a suicide mission, this was the way to go about it. Uh, there were no uh, parachutes to speak of. Uh, if the, these planes are flimsy at the beginning, they're not much better at the end. And if the, the wing gave way in a dogfight, uh, you went down to the earth and you met a horrible death. Sometimes you can get shot by uh, flying too close to the ground, on and on and on. In fact, uh, a high percentage of the men, something like 80%, I think it's that's a little high, about 70%, maybe 80% of the men who went up in World War I eventually died in it. One famous example from America is a guy named Quentin Roosevelt. He is the youngest son of Theodore Roosevelt. He died in World War I as a pilot. Uh, and uh, I say that about the suicide partially because I also remember as a young kid, young about 10 years old, there was this old man who was being interviewed on television, so this would have made it about 1987, 1990, and he was somewhere in his mid-90s at that point, and he said, I, he's like, I wanted to die. I did not want to commit suicide and shoot myself and dishonor my family, so I joined the Army Air Corps. And he proceeded to live through the war, and that just shocked the snot out of him, so he decided, I must have something to do, I must be of a greater purpose, and he ended up living to be 90 years old. So uh, you don't always get what you wish for, I suppose. So you had those sorts of things. And last but not least, when you talk about the advances of World War I, weaponry in World War I that's effective, really effective, is the development and usage by the Germans of the Unterseeboot, the U-boat, or to us, we might even call it the submarine, the submarine. So the submarine's there. 
and it is going to the submarine is going to wreck is going to wreck British shipping and uh, if the British had not been able to figure out with the assistance of the Americans the convoy system quite honestly the British were about to fail in World War One. well as the war drags on and the war gets going it, it devolves especially in the West into that stalemated battle of attrition out east you're gonna have a battle called Tannenberg which really breaks and crushes the Russians and they're never the same again uh, other battles and other sectors of the war the Turks d d deal the British a crushing loss at a place called Gallipoli and it's gonna ruin at least seemingly ruin the career of a young man he's not that young but he's not old uh, a uh, youngish politician named Winston Churchill he was going to be cashiered because of it Winston Churchill's career was greatly affected by uh, World War One, as Hitler's was in the trenches there for the Germans. But uh, for the year for the war, really, when you talk about the year of battle, the year would be 1916. And there's two battles that we need to discuss here for a few moments, and then I'll probably start bringing the Americans in in a second. Uh, the fact of the matter is, when you talk about the about World War One and that year of battle, 1916. Oh, let me stop right here. So we're now at 50 minutes in. Uh, when I stop talking about the the submarine, the Unterseeboot, the U-boat as it's also called, that was the end of what will be on this exam. Everything point forward now will be on the next exam, will be a uh, lecture for Monday. So if you keep watching, great. If you want to stop, pick it up at 50 minutes, we, we, your choice. You do what you need to do there. So anyways, uh, the uh, as far as the the... War, the battle, the year of battle, 1916. Really, two battles that we need to point out that are absolutely uh, gigantic affairs. Uh, the one, the first battle is called Verdun. V E R D U N. Say it again. V E R D U N. Verdun is a massive affair that goes essentially from February, I believe it, to December 1916 between the British, excuse me, the French and the Germans over this series of fortifications commonly called Verdun. They're on the common boundary between the Germans and the French. The Germans and the French, the Germans especially, had figured out, okay, the French uh, have stopped us in the Low Country. Our, uh, our Schlieffen plan is in tatters. We might need to try to figure out how to win the war in 1916. It'd be nice. And on top of that, we, the Germans, have come to the conclusion, rightly so, that the French esteem, think so highly of Verdun. Verdun to them is kind of like uh, Richmond to the Confederates. Say Washington, D.C. to the Yankees. Um, I don't know. There's probably half a dozen other Paris to the French again whatever. My point is is that the French have spent blood, treasure, and tears by 1916 on that fortification of Verdun. And for the French military, the French army, holding Verdun, defending Verdun, and, and getting it back if you lose it is the end-all to be-all. It is the sacred cow you cannot let go of. So the Germans make the calculation shrewdly that if they can get a hold of it, then the French are going to assault so ferociously to get that back that if you can hold on to it, the French will bleed themselves white trying to get Verdun back. And for the next uh, essentially nine months or so, maybe ten months, the French are going to lob shell, manpower, and everything they got at the Germans to drive them out of Verdun, and eventually they do it. The Germans did not want to give it up, obviously, but uh, it's cost the Germans dang near, well, half a million casualties, maybe 600,000, and the French are going to lose more. But what it does is it's this, the Battle of Verdun plus other events as well are going to sap the strength of the, of the uh, French army. And by 1917, the French army is a shattered unit. The morale is gone. The moral is gone, as it sometimes has been called over years. The esprit de corps that it started out with in 1914 is a wreck of its former glory self. It's not there. In fact, many of the men who started out in 1914 in the army are dead or wounded or out of the war altogether. So you've got a bunch of recruits and a bunch of conscripts who may not want to be there. And frankly, it seems like all you get the order from the French government is attack and die. 
And on top of that, the French army has a bad habit and a bad reputation in World War I for making orders, giving orders, and if you ask any questions, you get court-martialed for it. You get uh, not necessarily beheaded, but if you get too horsey over the subject, you do. My point is, is that uh, they didn't believe they could win. They didn't believe their life was worth anything. It was kind of a fatalism. And then you start to see the seeds of mutiny by 1917 sowed in the French army. French army. And so it's not good for the French. After Even though they won Verdun, it's almost like it's a pyrrhic victory. Uh, a victory won at such high cost that it might cost you the war overall. Verdun is a massive affair in World War I. Now... In World War I, 1916, the year of battle, here's your next, I put it for you for no apparent reason, evidently. But the next battle is, and it's really kind of a, a sad moment as well, it's called the Somme, S-O-M-M-E. -M -M -E. The Somme River is a boggy, brackish bayou sort of river. I don't want you quite thinking like Louisiana bayous, but it is uh, overrun, choked over, small, I mean, just milk. It's a quiet sector in July of 1916. The uh, British, in fact, actually had been a quiet sector for some time. The French are fighting for their lives in the summer of 1916. Verdun is not a settled issue. It's not going to be settled later. Who's going to win that? The French are trying to do their best. And in fact, uh, I should have said this perhaps a minute ago, the French, when they were uh, attacked by the Germans, weren't just trying to... Uh, to to the the Germans weren't just trying to beat the French and cause them to bleed themselves over Verdun. The Germans looked upon France as the sword in the hand of Britain, and we need to knock the sword out of the British hand. So the British recognize that their sword, their friend, their ally, is in real trouble, and the French are begging their al their allies for help. You have got to to open a second front. You have got to draw some of that strength away from the Germans. They are they we may lose and you have got to do something. So the Germans, excuse me, for the so the British come to the conclusion they can open up a new front, a new sector, if you like, in the Somme. And the British, by the way, at this point in time their army has suffered casualties as well. And these casualties are much in the same vein as the French. Not as extreme, but they're still there. The French, the British army that went over the sea, over the English Channel in 1914, that army, especially the officer corps, is essentially shattered and dead. This is a recurring theme. And you might understand why there's such pessimism. For those, uh, none of you in that class read uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, but there's that pessimism in that book. If you, read, if you want to read a good anti-war book, that's it. It's one of the best ones. All Quiet on the Western Front. But in uh, June of 1916, the British High Command, Al, uh, uh, General Haig, H-A-I-G, General Haig is going to put together a ambitious strategy, an ambitious strategy that basically says this, the German sector at the Somme has not been pulverized. The German sector at the Somme has not been attacked. It's been quiet, and those Germans are not that good of troops. And so what we as Brits are going to do in about a ten, about seven-day period before Ju July 1st, so those last few days of June 1916, we Brits are going to take over and essentially lob into the Somme River Valley millions of, uh, well, about a million artillery shells. I mean, they are going to rain hellfire and brimstone down upon the Germans in that Somme River Valley. And what the thinking was from the British High Command, we're going to lob so many shells, artillery blasts down onto the Germans that they will all die. Or and those who weren't dead will kill them when we get there. In fact, uh, we're going to lob so much into it, uh, it'll be an open door all the way to Berlin. That was some of the talk. This is, this is going to be our shot as Brits to win the war. And they do one of the great artillery barrages in the history of mankind. Over this 10-mile approximately area, they dump lots and lots and lots of tons of explosives into that area. 
first problem they had though, and you know this is uh, this is World War One, so it doesn't seem to work out good for anybody. The first problem the Brits have is is that they dump this into a river valley that is not hard. Uh, it, in most marshes, most river valleys are boggy and swampy. Some of the the shells went into the ground and stuck, it didn't go off. Others course did go off and what you do the more pounding and the raining of the shells coming down onto this German position the forward German position uh, the biggest problem you've got is is that you're turning the Somme River Valley into nothing more than a moonscape that is not even that, that firm it is marshy boggy and just absolutely a mud pit and it's going to slow down any assault you have because the British think we're going to be able to make a couple miles the first day maybe a couple miles the second day and then move on from there and we'll be able to go on to Britain, Berlin, excuse me, Berlin's the capital of Germany. July 1st, one of the great days in this war. And I don't mean that in a great sense. It's kind of like saying the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's not going to be good. July 1st, 1916. It is deadly. The British had thought that when they gave the signal, Look at your uh, watch. By the way, this is another development in essence from World War One. This watch, the 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 watch that you set your time, you go over the top H hour, D day, those sorts of things. That's World War One. It's not World War Two. But you look at your watch, your wrist watch, and you're going to go. What we're going to go over the top at 10 a.m. We're going to go over the top at 9 a.m. It depends on the sector you went over, but it's a basic idea. And so. Uh, some officers were so confident that this artillery barrage I've just talked about with, had done its duty, had done its deed, that they said, I'm not even going to carry my own, uh, I'm not even going to carry a gun. I will carry, at most, a pistol, and all I'm going to do with that pistol is point the way forward to Berlin. It'll be nothing more. It'll be easy. And the British, along a 10-mile front, go over the top. And the Germans, who were supposed to be dead, weren't. They come out of their bunkers. They come out from underneath the rubble. Some Germans certainly did die in the artillery barrage, but far too many lived. They open up their machine guns, and they cut these Brits to pieces. One of the great books in military affairs, and if you really wanted to increase your knowledge on the subject, the book I would suggest you read is this one right here. And it's not just World War I. It's just a great book overall. It's one of the classics. Uh, go over to Amazon, find it half.com, uh, probably even uh, half price books. It's, it's called The Face of Battle by John Keegan. It came out about 20 years ago. No, about 35 years ago, excuse me. In the first uh, day, July 1st, 1916, 21,000 men had been killed in the first day's attack, of which those 21,000 approximately in the first hour probably 17,000 men died. 60,000 casualties in total, so there were thousands upon thousands of men who had died. Casualties of 60,000, uh, this is a 1302 class, so I may have just mention it offhand, but 1302 1301, you talk about a battle in the United States called Gettysburg. It's a really nasty affair. Uh, kills 63,000 approximately. That was a three-day affair. The casualty list for the British, one side of the war. 60,000 in one day. Over 20,000 dead. And it was supposed to be a cakewalk to Berlin, and of course it's not. It's supposed to take miles, and you take 100 yards. Attack and die. So what do you do on July 2nd? You attack again, and again, and again. One of the complaints coming out of World War I, especially in the 1930s, was that the generals were unimaginative. They had no charisma, no ability to do anything different. They were hidebound. They just slaughtered men for bankers and for uh, ammunition specialists and munitions builders and what have you. They were, everybody was in cahoots. It's not true, but there are times when you read about British strategy and you read about British thinking and like, come on, even if it doesn't work, try something, try something different or just stay in your trench. And again and again, the British go. 
Uh, it's ultimately a German victory. The Germans are not routed. They're not driven. They're not sent back to Berlin. The Germans lose many men. They lose hundreds of thousands of men, but the British, this is their day. This is their, uh, their horrible day. Their horrible days. And the British will lose in excess of half a million men over the, the course of the song. So what you talk about here is, is that this year of battle, 1916, is a year that everything seems to be falling apart. The British are just getting carved up. The French are shattered. The Germans, they're not doing great, but they seem to be holding the upper hand. And by 1917, the French army is so shattered, it's uh, mutinying. In fact, there will be units that when they're given the order to go over the top attack and and die, they basically say, no, no. The Communist Party, the Communist movement had made inroads in France and had made inroads in the army. As the catastrophe of the war was unwinding, or unfolding, I should say, it's not unwinding, but unfolding, it made uh, a venerable, the Communists made an venerable impression that this is not for you. The, it's the rich man's war and the poor man's fight. Are you going to allow yourself to be slaughtered in the name of whatever? And by 1917, there were enough dead men that that sort of talk and that sort of uh, analysis was supported, was um, made interesting and, and believed in by some French soldiers, probably several thousand. But there was a mutiny. There was a mutiny. 1917... The, the Allies, as they're called, the British, the French, sometimes Italian, sometimes not, look like they're going to lose this war. They look like they're going to lose this war. And maybe they were. But in 1917, their hope and their salvation arrived in the form of the American Doughboy. And uh, the American Doughboy isn't, oh, it's a, that's a, that's a hard thing for me to talk about sometimes. I, I really find World War I interesting. It's probably my favorite war to discuss. Maybe the Civil War is right up there with it. Maybe it's, you know, some of the other stuff. But uh, there are days as a historian, and I'll tell you this, I, I really think that uh, the United States made a mistake by getting involved in World War I. Um, Maybe in the scheme of things that the Germans had to be broken of the militarism. I mean, the Germans today are pretty much pacifists. But I'm not certain it was the right thing for us to get involved in World War I. Uh, because of all that I've said in class, all I said today happens in the aftermath and the afterwash of World War I. So, but regardless of what I think, regardless of what I think, it needed to be done. That's what we did. In 1917, the Germans are looking to knock the British and the French out of the war once and for all. The Germans by 1917, though seemingly with an upper hand and militarily on the battlefield, they do have the upper hand. The Germans by 1917 are, uh, they're starving. They're starving. And the German shipping had been gone. It, it was gone effectively. Uh, German, the German home front, men and women were uh, were hurting. The rations were uh, being cut. There was uh, almost food riots in the streets in Germany. In fact, when you talk about the uh, the the war itself, and from the American perspective, uh, you know, when you think of a birthday cake, you know, you make it with what flour, eggs, and those sorts of things. Well, flour was in, in scarce supply there in Germany in World War One, especially by 1917. What do we do? How do we make a birthday cake? Well, we need some filler. Why don't we fill it with wood chips, sawdust? You can eat it. Not pleasant, but you can eat it. So they did that sort of thing. The Germans are in bad shape. They are looking to win the war. They need to get it over with. How can we do this? Well, first things first, in 1917, the Germans are going to send a secret weapon, if you like, to Russia. And that man's name is Vladimir Lenin. The Russian army, I've 
not talked a lot about them. The Russian army had its own mutinies. The Russian army was ranked with Bolshevism. The Russian army was misled, mishandled, miss everything. And the Russian army by 1917 is tired of war and it's disintegrating. That massive, seemingly endless supply of manpower is saying, they're throwing their hands up and saying, no more. Vladimir Lenin, who will be the father of communist Russia, is living in Berlin at the time, and the, and the Germans basically go to Lenin and say, if we put you into Russia, if we can get you into Russia, will you get out of the war should you come to power? And, and Lenin said, you got it. I'll be glad to do it. And so he infiltrates, he, Lenin, infiltrates Russia, eventually comes to power, and he, Lenin, will sign off on a treaty called Brest-Lavosk which basically signs over a good portion of Russia to get out of the war, and the Germans are able to go on the single front. Out west, the Germans are having success against the British uh, with those U-boat campaigns. And they're putting tons and tons and numerous ships to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Some of those ships are uh, almost American. And uh, the British are in big trouble. And so the Germans in 1917 make the calculation. In fact, the discussions have been going on since before then. But the Germans in 1917 say, look, we have got to win this war. The home front's getting dicey. Uh, we've got to get out of this. At some point, we need to win this thing. And the last thing we need is to have the United States come in. But the bigger problem is if this stalemate goes on, we can't sustain this. The men, men can't sustain it. The economy can't sustain it. We have got to win this war. Okay, what do we do? Well, we got to bring the British to their knees. We got to shut down British supplies. Where are they coming from? Most British supplies by 1917 are American. Well, you do realize, uh, and this is the conversation within the German high circles. You do realize if you start not only attacking British ships, but you all start also start attacking American ships, and start sinking American boats, that is going to cause the Americans to declare war. Yeah, probably so. Well, what do you want to do? If the Americans declare war, they can't get here in any numbers for about 18 months, maybe even as much as two years. They're so disorganized, they're so inept, they're so not ready for war, uh, it's going to take them a long time. So while they may declare war, we're wrapping it up. So we do it. It's called unrestricted submarine warfare. And the Germans in 1917 go on the offensive. And they start sinking everything that was headed toward Great Britain. And it's effective. It's effective. In fact, actually, what's interesting about American shipping, it was supposed to be allowed to go to, uh, American shipping was supposed to go be allowed to go to Germany because we had tried to be neutral, but that just didn't happen. So America in World War I, what causes us to get in? Several things. Obviously, the first one, the first major issue, the first major issue in World War I is going to be unrestricted submarine warfare against American naval interest. They, the Germans, are attacking and sinking our ships. Number one, so if that's the case, uh, some of you may be thinking, well, I heard somewhere about there was this great uh, uh, luxury liner, this English luxury liner called the Lusitania. The Lusitania, the, that old situation, <laughs> thinking about Justified last night. But anyways, the Lusitania is a, uh, uh, is a luxury liner. It's British. And uh, in 1915, it will be sent to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Or it's really not the Atlantic, but it's pretty, it's pretty close. It's right off the Ireland. Uh, a German U-boat sends it to the bottom. Well, in all uh, honesty, a... Uh, Lusitania, where it was hit at, how it was hit. Had the Lusitania been used for nothing but passengers, well, then it would be a, uh, it wouldn't have gone down in about an hour and a half is what they're figuring. But the Lusitania wasn't just packed full of passengers, some of which are American. The Lusitania is also packed full of uh, ballast that is actually materials for war. The British were using a luxury liner with a guess that the, the Germans wouldn't have the guts or the sands to uh, sink a passenger liner filled with munitions for war. Now, well, for the uh, 
for the passengers on the Lusitania, they got it, the British got it wrong. It went to the bottom in about 15 minutes. Maybe it was 18 minutes. It didn't take long. And those men and women died. And by the way, before you start feeling too sorry for the, uh, the passengers of the Lusitania, um, American, in 1915, American uh, luxury liners, which were not nearly as luxurious as British luxury liners. Think of it this way. It's like uh, an American luxury liner was like flying Southwest Airlines. Um, what is the uh, real high-class uh, airliner today? Uh, is it um, Virgin, I think? I think that's what it's called. Or maybe use an automobile. It's like the difference between a Chevrolet and a Mercedes. You wanted a real luxury uh, or a Lexus. You want a real luxury car, you go get one of those two, a Lexus or Mercedes. Foreign. But if you want something that uh, can do the job, it's just not very exciting. It's a Chevrolet. Nothing against Chevrolet. It's just you get the point. So a lot of Americans who did travel in Lusitania wanted it uh, to go there because it was luxurious. American ships were not being sunk in 1915. American passenger ships were not being sunk. They're not being fired upon. And on top of that, the German imperial government had even warned Americans in 1915, don't go on the high seas. If you go on a British ship, it is liable to be attacked and sunk. And that's what happened. But Americans were upset. What will Woodrow Wilson do? Woodrow Wilson in 1915 is going to be assiduously passive. He is going to call it watchful waiting. At other times he talks about how Americans not only must be uh, neutral in, in deed, but they also must be neutral in thought. He, Wilson, along with his Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, are going to try, at least at first, to go through a uh, neutrality process to stay out of this war. We try to get out of this war, start to stay away from it. And the reason they talk about being neutral is not just because it's perhaps good politics, good economics, they just are, and, and Wilson, to his credit, is uh, hesitant to go to war. It may also be the fact that Wilson is also looking at the United States in 1915 and says, okay, there are a lot of Germans and German-Americans who are sympathetic, and there are a lot of other immigrants who are also sympathetic to the Austro-Hungarians, the Germans, and so on. So there's a lot of Americans who may not be good, all right, real happy about us getting into bed, figuratively speaking, with the British. So keep all that in mind. But the sinking of the Lusitania started to sharpen up the Wilson administration and, and uh Brian basically said, those go folks got on that ship, they knew what they were doing, why are we upset about this? And Brian, to his credit, resigned out of the Secretary of State slot for it. In 1916, Woodrow Wilson runs on a platform not of let's go to war, though some will be saying we ought to go to war with Theodore Roosevelt. Wilson is running on a platform in 1916 of we, he kept us out of war. Americans, for the most part, 1916, did not have a burning desire to go to war, I don't think. Uh, but some do. Roosevelt, I just mentioned, he was hot to trot to go to war. But when Roosevelt was out of power, he often did that sort of thing. What else brings the United States into World War One? Well, it's not just unrestricted submarine warfare. Ship is sending ships to the bottom. There are a lot of American freighters in 1917 that go to the bottom. What happens? What causes us to go to war in 1917? Well, you might write this down. Uh, is is that uh, I would say like this: How many of you? I'll the write down part will happen in a second. But how many of you would be upset about ships going to the bottom? And think of it from a little different perspective: Why would a Kansan worry about unrestricted submarine warfare other than just pure patriotism? Probably not. What is it that concentrates the minds of Texans and Arizonans and Coloradoans and Kansans? Well, this is the second part. This is the other shoe to drop. Now, for actually, really, in a sense, be a third shoe. The other shoe to drop is the fact that in in Mexico in 1910, Mexico had erupted into a revolution in 1910. We, because of the Roosevelt Corollary, and we, because of our, our Monroe Doctrine, and we, because we are the United States, had gotten involved, uh, probably unwisely in some respects, into the Mexican Revolution. One of the men who was trying to play footsie with Woodrow Wilson, figuratively speaking, but trying to get Woodrow Wilson's backing in the Mexican Revolution is a fellow named Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa. 
Most of you have heard his name before. He is uh, the one of the northern rebels in the Mexican Revolution of 1910. But by 1916, Villa's star is an eclipse. Villa's star is an eclipse. In addition to that, uh, because his star is an eclipse, it looks like people are flowing away from him. He gets desperate. In 1916, Villa crosses into the United States as a pick of rage and fury against Wilson in the United States. Villa attacks Columbus, New Mexico and kills approximately 20, 25 people. And they'll then do that again in several other uh, border towns in uh, New Mexico, and I believe also in Arizona. Well, you know as well as I do, if, uh, if someone attacks the United States on the soil of the United States, that is kind of, that's Katie bar the door, or you call down the thunder sort of moment. So the U.S. Army is going to be sent in force down into Mexico chasing after Pancho Villa. Reality is, is that Villa becomes a national hero in Mexico. He's kind of lauded as that man who stuck the finger in the Yankee eye and lived to tell the tale. Is going to be a uh, song about. In fact, that's why we know about him today in a sense. He survives. He never caught, is caught by the U.S. Army, but uh, he's really effectively dispersed. He's never really the same again. He'll eventually die uh, in assassination. By the way, the man who leads the U.S. Army down into Mexico uh, is a fellow named John J. Pershing. John J. Pershing. That man's important. You need to know him. And the thing that made all this believable, made all this important in the national scheme of things, is this. And why it matters. Why Pancho Villa? Is that in 1917, a letter got out. In fact, it, was got, it got out by the British. The British slipped us a letter in, the, in their own cloak and dagger way. They slipped us a letter from uh, the German ambassador to Mexico, a fellow named Zimmerman. It's called the Zimmerman Note, or the Zimmerman Telegram. The Zimmerman Note basically said that if Mexico declared war on the United States, that Germany would back Mexico, and that if Germany and Mexico won the war against the United States, the British, and so forth, that Mexico would get back Texas, California, New Mexico, Arizona, and so forth, and, and retribution in return from what had happened in 1848 with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Reality is, is the Mexican army had no more ability to break away Texas and those other states at that time at all. However, because of Pancho Villa's raid, all that sort of stuff, plus the unrestricted submarine warfare, seemed like Germany, and some justification it is, a direct threat to the United States. It is trying to destroy the United States and when the United States over the years feels like it's being threatened it reacts and it reacts violently and goes on a massive attack. Okay. The last and final reason we go to war with uh, the Germans is partially is a lot to do with the fact of called something called propaganda. Propaganda is this idea that uh, well, propaganda, most people think it's a lie. Sometimes it's got kernels of truth in it. Sometimes it's got more than about two or more like a dozen kernels of truth. But it depends on the circumstances. The British over the years of the war were def desperate to get the United States in the war. And so they talked about and did everything in their power to draw us in. In World War I, there was something called the Rape of Belgium. The Rape of Belgium. Supposedly, the Germans, as they marched through Belgium in 1914, started killing and murdering and slaughtering people left and right, a la the Nazis in 1941. That didn't happen. In fact, one of the stories was that this little boy from Belgium had stepped out in front of a German division as was marching through his little town. In this division, these men stopped, grabbed the boy by the throat, jacked him up against the wall, and then pulled their knives and slit the boy's throat ear to ear didn't happen. Did not happen. And then other acts of barbarity and cruelty were supposedly perpetrated by the Germans. In fact, uh, the British were doing everything in their power to tell us how bad the Germans were. And they weren't. It was more or less lies. 
In addition to that, the British were reading all of our cable traffic, all of our mail, all of our uh, diplomatic traffic. And that Zimmerman note I mentioned just a minute ago, they had it for a week trying to figure out how they could give it to us without us figuring out that, that we were reading cable traffic, or rather they were reading our cable traffic. The British were doing everything in their power to get us into the war because we had the manpower they didn't anymore. We had the economy that couldn't be touched. They realized if the U.S. got in the war and got in in time that Germany would probably lose the war and the British would be victorious. What if the Brit Americans figure out it was a lie? Well, we'll deal with that later. Right now, we've got to win the war from the British perspective. So in April, early April 1917, in response to the unrestricted submarine warfare, the Zimmerman note, uh, the propaganda over the years, basically what it boils down to is the U.S. Congress declares war against Germany, and we're now in. That's a pretty good place to stop. I think it's uh, one hour and 25 minutes, 24 minutes by my count. So that's a good enough place to stop, and uh, we'll call it a day, and we'll see you back on Wednesday uh, of next, yeah, Wednesday of next week. So thank you.